What's happening, guys, and welcome to our weekly Impact podcast. I'm Keith, and I am joined by Ro once again. What's up, man? Not much, Keith. How you doing, man? I'm doing all right. It seems like the theme for this week is hashtag Impact on YouTube. I was going to try <laughs> and catch the uh, Twitch stream last night, but I was actually uh, watching the uh, Ted Bundy tapes before on Netflix and then ended up falling asleep. So, uh, yeah, Impact on YouTube. It's funny, though. I basically got to catch the entire show because all the things that were left out on their imp- on the YouTube page was actually posted on their Twitter page. So any little in-between thing that I missed was there. So I basically got to see the entire show. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, you know, I, you know, uh, you know it's well stated. That's how I, know, you know, watch Impact nowadays. And then what I just all do, I'll go to like a page that has the results and just catch up on the angles. But that's cool that Twitter provides that. So really, you can watch, you know, YouTube for the matches and some of the angles that they provide and then catch the rest on uh, Twitter. Which is funny because there was a lot that they left out on the um on the YouTube page, like we had an LAX, uh, the clubhouse segment, which Conan said he was going to, you know, get that rematch. And then we ended up seeing Conan talk with the Lucha brothers after they faced the rascals. And none of that was on the, uh, the YouTube page. It was just the match. That's interesting. I, I yep. wonder if maybe they're going to start dialing it back because, you know, people had said you can watch the whole show on YouTube. So, yep. mm-hmm. I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility. But, yeah, I'm, that, I'm, that's interesting seeing that that, that that's a you know, big team. And that, I was saying the same thing. What, uh, by any chance, how did they do uh, numbers wise? Um, from what I saw, I think they hit maybe 7,000. I don't know. I fell asleep at about... Mm. 10 30 11 o'clock so um but i didn't hear anything but that's kind of a huge drop from last week sixteen thousand. um just strange how they can't seem to hold the base week to week yeah that's almost half you but see it there there's my thing and i know there's a you know a part of people who believe numbers don't matter and I mean, I guess, I mean, I think it's one of those things when, when the numbers are favorable, they matter, but when they're lower, they don't. But I think now you're starting to see, or not even now, but you're starting to see it wasn't always, or it's not always that people can't catch, you know, due to schedule conflicts or lack of access. I think sometimes too, it's a fan interest. Like I think sometimes some people, you know, they might look at the sp- spoilers or see the match card that's advertising if they're not feeling it nah, let me just skip out you know because that's a big drop and you just mentioned you know for them to get what 16 i mean if they could at least flirt with 10k and i mean in the grand scheme that's not even a big number itself no to flirt around with that number at least you're establishing that base but we see it's it's just a big leap and then a big drop you know, yeah. so like next week they might hit nine thousand. So then you look back, it's like okay, we went from sixteen to seven to nine. Okay, what's working? What's not working? I right. think that's something that management, you know, should look into. Well, I think another thing, and I've talked about this in the past, is they basically advertise the entire show on social media prior to it happening, so people pretty much know what to expect, and they can basically pick and choose what they want to watch by just going to YouTube after the fact and being like, all right, I only cared about this, so I'm just going to check that out. Then I don't have to watch the whole show. That's true, and then especially when you're thinking about, too, some of these matches are really repetitive. Um, We'll get into it, but you know, there's matches on here that two, three weeks ago we seen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once again, like I said, goes to fan interest. And um, I do believe there's an audience that wants to see some fresh matchups, you know, some new people kind of spotlighted. And I know we got a little bit of that, but I think, yeah, that's just one thing I, I really hope management looks into and, you know, tries to improve upon. But, you know, yeah. w- remains to be seen. <laughs> Absolutely. So what do you think overall of the show? You know, I thought it was all right. Um, I really thought it was very storyline driven, which is something that you and I have both talked about ad nauseum. We like critiqued. How, we weren't negative. <laughs> like how we, you know, talk about where they have just match after match after match. And um, yeah, it was all right. You know, um, 
once again, you just mentioned right now, I think everyone has a different opinion. There's some people who watch Impact and every single week they're, you know, blown away. Whereas us, you know, there's weeks that, that, hey, this is really good. And other weeks we're like, this was fine. And, you know, this is one of those weeks for me where I felt like it was fine. Yeah, no, I thought it was pretty good. They did some really good things. There were some things that I really didn't care for. But, um, yeah, no, overall, I thought it was good. Easy watch like it usually is. Uh, so we open the show with Rich Swan versus Ethan Page. Um, this basically was a match to further the Rich Swan Sammy Callahan storyline. Swan ends up picking up the victory with Phoenix Splash. Um, it was funny. It was pointed out the other day. I think there was a Cage Side Seats article. Um, it was an interview with uh, Ethan Page about you know the positivity and promoting where you work. Um, and they had mentioned that Ethan's record was four and nine or four and ten in the company right now and uh this just adds another one of those losses to the uh loss column well and then on top of that um you know he just recently resigned and you know i know we'll get into moose later about resigning as well but you know my thing is like this and we see we, we talked about this like a dead horse with the roster being so thin it's so hard for them to build people because you know somebody has to take the fall and this is a guy that you resign so you know one would believe that they have some high hopes for him and his future is bright but you know putting you know he's pff, i forgot the last time he's won a match and you just say I would assume, oh well he had that dq victory over eddie edwards so that's technically not even a victory uh and he beat matt seidel to qualify for that ultimate x match yeah, so you know that that's the thing, you know. And then when you put them in a match with a champion, it's kind of a, a no win situation because, mm-hmm. you know, if he beats the champion, then I'm guessing he would get a title shot, and it's a non title. But and then if you have the champion beat them, then it's just you know I don't know. Like I said, it was one of these matches that it was more to uh, the post match angle. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And that was. Uh... OVE comes out. Sammy says that Rich Swan said that we were family. He hands him the shirt. Swan goes to throw it in oh, Sammy's yeah. face. Sammy stops him, says that, you know, family fight. We get into it. But family's everything. He ends up hugging Sammy. He puts the shirt on. They do the thumbs up, thumbs down thing. Swan hits Sammy with a super kick and then hits a springboard cutter on the Chris. Um, but the pr- crowd really got a good pop with uh, Swan turning on them. So, uh, the angle's working. We know who the clear face and heel is. And you can appreciate that. And I doubt people are going to be clamoring for Swan to turn heel anytime soon. So Yeah, no <laughs> need for it. No need for it, even if it is the easy option. Um, then we head to LAX's clubhouse. They ask Conan about that rematch. Conan says, what's the hurry? You, you want to just get your asses kicked again? Conan says, if you let me do my thing, we wouldn't be here in the first place. And he says that, let him do his job, and he will get that rematch. And then we get the debut of Ace Austin on Impact. Uh, he faced Jake Atlas. Uh, both guys seem to work well together. They had a couple good sequences. Uh, Ace Austin obviously picks up the victory after hitting a running blockbuster. So this was just, you know, a showcase match for him, basically. Um, I, I don't know what they're going to do with him. You know, he seems like he fits in with the rest of the other guys that they kind of don't have direction for you know it's what's terrible funny is, to say <laughs> you know what's funny is uh ace austin's finisher i don't know if you caught it but uh rich swan did it in his match against uh ethan page did he? <laughs> which i thought was <laughs> which i thought was funny but um when i watch this this is my bold prediction i give him five months he'll be x division champion yeah you think so yeah, I think with him, it's something about him. And we, we've seen with Impact at times when they sign a name, you know, a hot name, they'll, you know, feel motivated to really put a rocket on their back. And I think his style screams X Division. So I, I give it five months. He'll be he'll be champion. I don't think he'll take it off of Swan, but whoever Swan drops it to, uh, um, Ace will beat them. That's my bold prediction. All right. Yeah, I mean... The next pay-per-view, Rebellion, we'll probably get one of those multi-man X-Division matches for the number one contendership. I'm sure he'll be involved in it. So you never know. You might be onto something. 
Um, all right, so up next, this was probably the low point for me of the show. Uh, we see an injured Johnny Impact and Taya. They're being interviewed by the investigative reporter. Uh, they are apparently back home in California after uh, his injury he suffered last week. Uh, Johnny admits to letting Cage down, but he says Cage has been in the business long enough to know that injuries happen. And then the reporter tells him, you know, people work through injuries. At this point, Taya gets all snappy, and she says that they're talking about neck fusion. Then he's asked about the title match, and Johnny says he is a man of his word, and he promises Cage a title shot. Oh, boy. Oh yeah. Boy. <laughs> it, it just wasn't good all around. Like, uh, like I don't even know. It, it. Like, all I can literally say is it, it just wasn't good. See, the issue that I take with it, is it seemed more about Taya than it did Johnny to be to be quite honest, or at least that's how I took it. And I guess I'm looking at it like this, like, and this was one of my biggest fears, uh, the moment that they put the knockouts title on Taya. Was she gonna actually be holding her own, you know, representing the knockouts division, or is she gonna be tied into Johnny's storyline? Obviously, it seemed like it's the latter for the time being. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> Yeah, I this uh, I get it. We're gonna get a hill turn. Um, I, I really feel it's too little, too late. You know, I don't think this is gonna make you know people who were Johnny Impact detract detractors. If you didn't like Johnny before, you're not gonna like him anymore. He is hill. Um, but yeah, it was just all all around cringeworthy, and um, I just <laughs> I I feel like if Ty's gonna be involved in all this. I hope somebody takes the belt off of her because the belt's going to be playing hostage while she's part of this angle with her husband. Yeah, and it seems like that's a common theme with things that the company has done in the past. So hopefully that isn't the case. And uh, we will talk about the number one contenders match for that title a little later on. Um, then we have Alicia. She comes out to the ring and says that her contract is up at the end of the month. She's undecided on what she's going to do, either staying or basically going back home. The uh, Desi Hit Squad comes out, they run her down, tell her she should go back home and do basically woman's work. She ends up slapping Gamma. Eddie comes out with a kendo stick. Eventually the Hit Squad overpowers Eddie. Eli comes out, looks like he's going to help the Desi Hit Squad. He hits Raj and Rohit with some gravy trains, and that was it. I thought this was a really good segment. Um, they haven't done this in a while, but they really did establish the desi hit squad as the heels um I, I know i had made mention of it that i think a few weeks back they had apparently cut a promo beforehand that got the crowd against them and uh i thought they achieved what they set out to do in this segment you know i didn't think there was anything wrong with having alicia come out i mean i know for the most part she's they've <clears throat> excuse me use her as a lower uh, level talent you know she normally wrestles on explosion which you know that's fine for her um but and you know to give her a mic and you know run that angle i just feel like with you having the desi hit squad like why what why would she take what they say into consideration they've been jokes the whole time in impact so that was a, that was my thing. I guess you know. Once again, it was just set up to have uh, Eli come and make the save, and mm -hmm. you know, potentially Eli face turn. I I wouldn't look too much into it because you know, right now it might seem that way, and then they could you know throw you know throw us a curve in the end. So, but I mean, if this was a way to potentially turn Eli face, then success. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, you know, Raj and Rohit both sounded very confident on the mic which, you know, they really haven't been given much to shine. I mean, if anybody's been doing the work, it's been Gamma. And, you know, as we've seen, they haven't really done much with the hit squad. They've just become yeah. basic jokes of the tag division. You know, they they really had an opportunity last year. <clears throat> and once again, it's part of, I'm thinking now, this is going to happen with anyone who's champion, where you're running through teams so quick. Like, I really thought with the Desi hit squad, they could have been, you know, next to OVE, your top hill tag teams where, you know, the face champions, these are the ones that they can have, you know, long drawn out feuds with. But instead they lose like anytime they're advertised for a match. I, I don't even need to see the match. I already know their opponent's going to win. So yep. they're just a jobber heel tag team. And, you know, you ask yourself, what value is it? 
is to are they i should say right yeah no and i mean that's that's a big takeaway and I, i'm not even going to fault impact here because it seems like every wrestling promotion has those tag teams where you know they're automatically going to lose and i think that this is a big thing that takes away from the and this business in general, it's not the anything can happen. Anybody has a chance to win anymore. But it is what it is. Um, then we see Reno Scum. They cut a promo backstage saying KM and Falaba got a fluke victory. So we're probably going to get a rematch there. Uh, that wasn't on the YouTube as well. And this next segment, next two segments actually weren't as well. Um, we had Alicia and Eddie backstage. Eli walks up. Eddie thanks him for watching his back. Eli's pushing for that tag team gold again. Eddie says he's good. Alicia tries to be the voice of reason. She says she sees something between the two of them. He, she tells Eddie he's the only one you've got left. Eli says they'll face the hit squad. If that doesn't work out, it'll be a one-time thing. Interesting. This this has probably been one of the best storylines they've had going between Eli and Eddie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I felt like that should have been something that was on the uh, the YouTube page because it is furthering something um, oh. rather than like the Rascal segment, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, and then we have Killer Cross and Moose. They're interviewed by Melissa. She talks about what happened last week and asks what's next for them. Moose does his usual thing of hitting on her. Cross says they told them last week that if they weren't getting a title shot, then no one was getting one. Moose says he let, let's celebrate. He has reservations at a steak uh, house, and then he tries to get Melissa to go with him, but he gets shot down. Um, so do you remember there was rumors going around that the reason that Mackenzie had departed the company was because she was uncomfortable in the uh, the position she was put in with Moose? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I, I highly doubt that was the case. Oh, yeah, I think it was just more of... Um... You know, she probably had other interest interest. And we, we see now because, you know, I told you, I said impacts really becoming couples retreat because everyone who's kind of it with the company, they have some ties, whether it's mm-hmm. a relationship or et cetera. So, you know, they just figured we can bring in uh, Melissa Santos, who, you know, who happens to be Cage's, I think, wife. Or, but uh, she's she's fit the role fine. And hey, Moose is another person that, you know, recently re- resigned. Um, hopefully I have big plans for him. I thought it was just funny to see Cross and Moose kind of, um, I don't want to say working together, but, you know, next to one another after, you know, they kind of had a fallout. But I like the fact that the, their eye is on trying to get title shots. Um, I know we wouldn't see it, but <laughs> a, a great idea what I would love is like if they booked some triple threat where you had Johnny defending against Moose and a Killer Cross. Yeah. I just think that <clears throat> that'd be interesting. Yeah, but they'd somehow find a way to shoehorn Cage in there. Yeah, I'll, n- I'll never understand <laughs> it. I mean, you know, and, and, you know, I've just kind of accepted it. But if we're going to get this Johnny Hill turn, here's the one thing I'm going to ask you. They're supposed to be teaming up at that uh the United as we stand. Right. So and you know, the thing we know is, you know, since impact tapes so you know far along and stuff, they obviously can't you know what what they have taped and what happens on the Twitch shows usually doesn't correlate. But with something like that, and you know, they're doing they're really making a big deal to promote this. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wonder, you know, I'd be interested to hear how they interact in that match. Yeah, I mean, those shows are pretty much non-canon, so... Um, yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, but, you know, that is, what, a month away? So it'll be interesting to see where we are at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, then we have the Rascals segment up next. Um, I guess they're talking about taking the Lucha Brothers masks, then they get their powers and get the wins. Um, and then Dez has Kiki Taro's mask. Then they make fun of Moose's attire, um, which is funny because had you not seen the segment beforehand with Killer Cross and Moose, you would have no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> well, I, I unfortunately didn't catch catch this, but it seems like, you know, typical rascal segment. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it had its its spots. It was funny, and but uh, yeah, that's that's about it. Then we have the uh, the Dark War, right? Is that what we're calling it? Or the Red Light Match? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so this was Rosemary, Kiara, and Jordan versus Sue Young, Allie, and I 
pretty sure the undead maid of honor. Um, you know, this was basically Rosemary's big return match. So, uh, her team obviously picked up the win. She hits a spear on the undead maid of honor. After the match, Allie gets restrained by Kiera and Jordan. Rosemary puts a collar on her and then drags her to the back. Um, I mean, you know, it was it was good for what it was. I feel like they could have done a lot more with it, you know, made it some sort of elimination match or no DQ or something, some sort of stipulation that made it a war, so to speak. You ever played <clears throat> thing, I'm sorry. You ever played the Virtual Boy? It came out like in the 90s. Uh yeah, I remember you know when I was a kid going into my closet where it was completely dark and playing like Mario Tennis or something like that. That was about it. Watching this match kind of reminded me of that in the red. <laughs> um you know, it's yeah, I was surprised too cuz normally when we hear and in these typical gimmick matches, it's usually some form of like a false count anywhere or a hardcore match, but they mm-hmm. just put a title. I mean, a, you know, a fancy title on it. Once again, this was more about storyline. I think now, because I, I had read somewhere where some people felt like this is dragged on, I've, you know, me being one of them, but I think Rosemary's injury was the reason why they dragged it on. I think now they can actually move on from at least Grace and Kiara's um, inclusion and just solely focus on Rosemary and Allie because that's pretty much, you know, the big picture. So um, hopefully we get that. I wouldn't be surprised in a couple weeks we see, you know, what we saw in Sue, (laughs) Allie versus uh, Kiara and uh, and, uh, um, Grace. Mm. But yeah, hopefully that I think that that was just my takeaway. I mean, the match is, you know, just a way to show that Rosemary's back. Um, she obviously is still kind of uh, recovering. Anyone who's sustained a lower extremity injury, you, you know, just because you're cleared. I mean, it still takes time to kind of get your groove back a little bit. So but I'm I'm really interested to see now what happens between the Rosemary and Allie feud. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just hope everyone else doesn't get thrown to the wayside. Uh, because as we've seen, Sue Young has kind of, unfortunately, that's happened to her since basically she dropped the title. I mean, um, I, I really think they could have gone somewhere with things had they had a bigger roster where she could have, you know, defeated people and all of a sudden they were joining her undead army or something like that. I don't know. I just feel like they there could have been a better use for her. So then we have a face tire. You know, you could have had her face tie. Mm-hmm. Like, I think, no, I was just saying, I think sometimes we forget, you know, with the champions that you can have that one off random challenge match. And, um, you know, like I said, it's random up until you have a feud ready to build. Like, she could have been that person. She has a cachet being a former knockouts champion. But, right. you know, once again, it's kind of like thinking outside the box sometimes. Well, who knows? There's going to be a former knockouts champion returning to the company. We'll see how she gets shoehorned in there. oh boy all right so uh we see glenn gilberti backstage he runs into conan conan says that callus says he should be the mascot of impact wrestling he keeps telling you know gilberti things to fire him up he tells him to go into management's office and cut a promo on him gilberti busts into the office going off on a tangent turns out it's killer cross in the room Gilberti starts apologizing, room goes dark, Cross beats the crap out of him, and we see him constantly going backstage, still looking for Callus. He runs into people who he thinks is Vince Russo, Jeff Jarrett, Cody and the Bucks. He ends up running into Scott Demore, who says, you know, where the hell have you been? And he's like, I'm looking for Don Callis. He's like, haven't you watched our show? He does commentary, and then Disco leaves. I, I like this. It was funny. Um, interesting how they threw, you know, the AEW reference in there and Jarrett and Vince Russo. Um, but what'd you think here? Yeah, I thought this was funny. Um, this is a good use for Disco. Um, he's pretty much a comedy wrestler. And uh, I think he's retired. I don't know if he actively actively still wrestles, but this is a good role for him. I, I really found this humorous. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you're not taking somebody with any real value and basically lowering them as a joke. So then we uh, we find out who Scarlett Bordeaux's opponent is. Uh, she's in the ring with... Uh, jo- what was that? I didn't say anything. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Something came through. Um, so she was asked uh, by Josh Matthews, 
who had the least amount of potential in her search. She brings up Disco. Um, I guess he was on commentary with Don Callis at this point. He ends up getting in the ring. He says, you're the hottest thing in business, and now you want to wrestle. You're going to suck. He then ru- runs down the women's re- women's wrestling, You know, basically saying it hasn't been good since Braun Panties matches. She ends up slapping him. He runs her down some more. She says she can kick his ass, and then we find out he's going to be her opponent in uh, three weeks, I guess, at, against all odds. I think that's what they said. <laughs> I just don't get, you know, in somebody had mentioned this on the YouTube uh, channel. Like, she's wrestled on Explosion, and I guess they play it that people <laughs> don't watch Explosion. And the One um, Night Onlys but, and the Twitch specials. So, and... I, I just ask you, Keith, what does this match do for Scarlett? If you're trying to debut her, I guess her uh, first impact wrestling, uh, um, her first match in impact, actually on the broadcast, what does this do for her beating Disco? Oh, it does nothing for her. The only thing it does is basically, you know, the women's empowerment. That's That's basically it. But don't you think, even I even use, even though I know that they've been looked at jokes, but don't you think if she had faced like Rohit Raju, for example, even though I know he's a jobber, but he's at, well, they use him in that, but at least he's an active wrestler. Like you have in Scarlet face a dude who, let's say, well, give or take, I'm going to guess, uh, Disco's probably late 40s, early 50s. Like, she, yeah, and he's not actively wrestling, so she should beat him. I, It's just one of those things, and I get the angle that they want to show is like, you know, women empowerment and stuff, and that's cool, but I would have thought it would have done more if she would have faced somebody who's currently active as opposed to somebody who doesn't wrestle. Mm -hmm. Um, But nonetheless, we're going to get her debut, and um, it's weird. I think this is one of these scenarios. I don't think Scarlett's going to be a face by any stretch, but I think she might play face just for this match just Mm -hmm. because Disco's Disco. Um, but yeah, I just don't don't really see what this does. In I feel like it's a waste of Scarlett's uh, talents. I would have rathered her face. Um, I don't know if Katarina's still on the roster, or you know, knows? hell, an an enhancement talent. I think it would serve better than facing some dude who you know doesn't wrestle anymore. And for those people, and I seen another one mentioned it when he had wrestled Jacqueline, and Jacqueline, you know. <sighs> You know, Hall of Famer, mm. a great, great wrestler. And I, in a sense, I felt like it brought her down when she beat him, you know, because he, you know, even during his time when he used to wrestle, I mean, he, you know, he was a comedy guy. I mean, yeah, he had some success, don't get me wrong, but he was just, sheer, you know, sheer comedy. And I felt like, you know, for someone who Jacqueline, who's, you know, serious uh, character, it brought her down, you know, messing around with them because they were wrestling, you know, pretty much a comedy style match. So I, I just didn't understand it. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's really going to go anywhere, and then she's just going to beat him and then be a part of the women's division? Is that where they're going to go? And, you know, that's going to be her momentum. I beat Disco Inferno. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So speaking about the knockouts division, Tessa and Melissa are backstage. Tessa says that, or Tessa will face the undefeated Jordan Grace to be number one contender for the knockouts championship. And then the winner will face Taya, I guess, in three weeks at against all odds. Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like this could have been such a big match that, you know, Tessa versus Jordan, where, you know, it could have been built for a different event. Um, and, you know, I guess the way they're putting Jordan in this match is just the fact that she's been undefeated. It, I, I don't know. I, I just I, I get it, but I, I don't get it at the same time. Where it doesn't make sense is you figure Tessa, what uh, it was a couple weeks ago, she loses to Taya. So essentially she should be in the back of the line. Like I get, get Grace getting the opportunity. Well, no, I don't get, get Grace getting the opportunity because all she's done has been wrestling the same people, getting wins over the same people, whether it's Sue Young or Ali. So all of a sudden now she's in, you know, in a match for the number one contendership. Yeah. I really thought this would have been a great opportunity to have some type of battle royal or some gauntlet, mm-hmm. you know, involve Kiera, uh, Grace, um, Tessa, 
Alicia, um, even okay, even if you want to just do a fatal four way, something like that, that kind of shows us that, hey, these are the women that, you know, are trying to challenge for the knockouts championship. Instead, you give us Tessa, who's we're assuming is feuding with Gail. So right away, you know, she doesn't have a snowball's chance in beating Grace, who's undefeated. So, yeah, well, <laughs> I think she's undefeated only right in singles. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure they've. It's been fifty fifty booking during the whole uh, undead realm. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So, okay, in singles, singles competition, am I supposed to believe that uh, Tessa's winning this match? No. <laughs> there you go. And I think that's just kind of one of the things. And I know some people don't look at it like that. They look at it, you know, these two opponents. And like you mentioned, this should have been something that. If you're going to have somebody of Tessa's caliber, this is something that they should have built on. It should have been a random, random, like, hey, we're going to face each other. You know, you could have had Tessa call, you know, cut a promo and and then have Grace come out and challenge her. Something like that. But instead, yeah. you just kind of just throw it like, here, here you go. Boom. Yeah, I figured this could have been a big match. You could have had it slam anniversary and stuff like that. But then, you know, it's things, things like that that. They've really screwed up, like with Killer Cross, having him face Johnny Impact back in, what, post Bound for Glory, and he lost, and then that killed any momentum he really had, and then, you know, they could have built him in Cage to be this big thing, but then Cage no-sells his offense and things like that. It's just little things that, I don't know, end up bothering me. So we have the main event, Lucha Brothers versus The Rascals. What did you think of this match? Yeah, no, I was just saying, I've, I've seen it before. They faced not too long ago, but I was uh, impressed that the Rassels got in the amount of offense that they got in. Um, but yeah, I mean, nothing I haven't seen before. Lucha Brothers get the win. Um, Rassels' wins only have come at the hands of the Desi Hit squad, mm-hmm. so I didn't expect anything, any type of upset. <laughs> yeah, the first show post-homecoming, we saw the Lucha Brothers versus the Rascals. And same result, right? Yep. Well, you're not going to have the champs lose, right? Well, I don't even think they were champs then and still got the oh, same yeah, result. That, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's changing, you know? That's I, true. And that's just, just the thing. Like, when when we see with these champions, you know, we we beat it, you know, like a dead horse where you need to have people that you can build as contenders. And then obviously you got to have people who are going to serve as enhancement. But when you're – when you know, a combination between where you've devalued a team or the roster's thin, it's hard to accomplish both those things. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Um, and then the big thing was backstage, Conan meets the Lucha Brothers. Uh, they tell LAX not to mess with their masks. He Conan says, what do you expect when you got in their faces? Lucha Brothers say they showed them respect by not getting physical and they should have respected their masks. They will get their rematch, but they will have to wait. And then Conan says, next time I see you, I want a date for that rematch. So I would assume that'll be a rebellion match. To me, this is poor storytelling. If you really want to, they, they really haven't done enough, at least in my eyes, to have me buy in that LAX are the heels. Because like they just mentioned, Lucha Brothers got in LAX's faces. LAX extended their hands out and they didn't want to shake their hand. Now they don't want to have a match with them. You tell me what faces do that. Now, yeah. you, <laughs> look back. I'm going to use Johnny Impact. There you example. go. <laughs> People want to turn him heel. He was coming out having open challenge. I don't know if it was an open challenge, but he was willing to face anybody. But you want to turn him heel, yet I'm supposed to buy Lucha Brothers faces who don't shake hands, which is a face gesture, get in the heel's face, which isn't a face gesture, and then decline a, a match, which is not a, a heel thing to do, but they're supposed to be the faces. <laughs> oh my god, you're never getting over this. <laughs> it, it, it just... I, I guess what just is, what annoys me so much because this has been a thing that this company has forever done even at pay-per-views, it was always a run-in and a, and a heel turn. Mm-hmm. And that's always kind of like, okay, this is going to be the answer to all our problems. And it, it does, like, it might work here and there, but it doesn't always work. Like, I I, I don't know. I know I got to accept it, but I just realized it feel like the, the storytelling with why LAX turned heel is just poor. 
um, because it, it seemed like they were just defending themselves. If you want to say them taking the masks and stuff, I mean, once again, someone got in their face. You know what you want them to do? Clothesline them and then pat them on the back like, hey, you don't want to shake our hands, but it's all good. Like, right. I, I don't know. Yeah. No, that's fair. And this is just going to drag out for another month and a half. And and that I guess that's my big big thing. And when you see the biggest gaps between pay per views, like some of their some of these feuds or what they might have in store at the pay per view, to drag that out for like months and stuff, mm-hmm. I just think like, <sighs> you know, you you run the risk of people being burned out. You know, when it when the match finally happens, especially when they're give us given, you know, giving us some, you know, whether it's matches or some type of involvement where, you know, they're interacting with one another, you know, on a weekly basis. Yeah. Well, it was like um, when they had their rematch from homecoming, they had built it up to be this great match. And, you know, it was good, but nobody really came out and checked out the show. There was, exactly. yeah, it was just your typical viewership, and it didn't seem like they added any value, even when Meltzer had said, you know, gave positive things about the match, but it it did nothing. And now mm-hmm. you're, this is going to be the fourth meeting between the two teams. Yep, I mean, you got some that that don't mind it. I mean, yeah, I I um I'm burned, I'm over it. I want to see someone new get that spot, but yeah. But it, Silly me. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's hard when everything else has been booked the way it is in the tag team division. I mean, the whole thing with Eli and Eddie, they, you know, if things end up working out and they're a tag team, they can definitely be a force to be reckoned with that would ha- have a shot at taking those titles off of the Lucha Brothers. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that at all. Yeah, yeah, but... uh so that was uh, that was impact. So we got a couple questions here. Um, the Chris Steele show asks. He says, "I don't know if you heard, but ROH just extended their streaming service to the Fight app. So basically, you can link their service with Fight TV and get discounts on pay per view shows." Now, I had this exact idea for the GWN months ago, but ROH stole it. But considering Anthem owns Fight TV, if GWN does exactly what ROH did, could would this help them monetize GWN and their pay-per-views? I mean, unfortunately, Anthem owns the Fight Network, not Fight TV. But, um, I mean, at this point, the, the GWN is just kind of a, a lost cause. I mean, everything can be seen on Twitch outside of the old shows. I mean, granted, they replay them all the time. Now Explosion, which was, you know, a GWN exclusive in the States, is now shown on Twitch during the week. What's the only thing you get? exclusive on the gwn the um one night onlys i think that and you can see other promotions matches mm. yeah they I, I really just kind of believe with the gwn um you know since they got the subscribers they're, you know they're getting some they're making some type of money off of it so that's the reason why they don't do away with it entirely but they've really botched it and i think this just comes to show you at times when you have so much so many regime changes everyone has different visions and let's face it gwn that was something that you know came up but in the jared when jared yeah. was back right yeah. so you know had jared still been around i think we probably would have gotten to a point where we could have seen pay-per-views at a discounted rate on the GWN. But, you know, it when when you come on board, like it's, you know, you compare it to the workplace. You can have a supervisor who, you know, implements certain policies and then, you know, they leave for whatever reason and you get a new supervisor. While they might, you know, follow some of those policies, they're going to want to instill their own policies of their own because that was something from an old regime. So the same thing with the GWN, like under Don and Scott, Twitch is the big thing. So yeah, you you know, it does make the GWN pretty much obsolete mm-hmm. in a sense, you know, outside of you're one of these people who wanted to go watch old matches, you know, from the old library. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I agree. I, I hate that impact. I couldn't, you know, capitalize on something like that. Right. I've been, I've been looking for a reason to justify, not that I do, but to justify subscribing. And, you know, if I can watch what I watch for free, I mean, I don't care about watching old matches like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I don't even think they change anything about the GWN, right? Since the regime's changed, it's pretty much been the whole setup the same time. Or the same setup the whole time, I should say. And yeah, I don't even think it could handle streaming pay-per-views. 
And I could just imagine how buggy it would probably be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, and then we have another question from Renegade Ataku. Uh, says, personally, I want to hear about new female upcoming talent being signed because you got to think about the future of the division. For example, Impact did a great job signing Tessa and Jordan. I'm pretty sure, though, at the end of the year, Tessa Blanchard's contract is going to end, so I really want to see some future stars shine in case she leaves. The only exception to my earlier point is that I'm very glad that Rosemary has resigned. Um, and he also adds, I think with the feud between Tessa Blanchard and Gail Kim could be a similar sort of feud with Shane McMahon and AJ Styles, where they actually transition Tessa to become a face. Just my speculation, though. Um, yeah, no, I think they really do need to uh, work for the future of the knockouts division. I mean, we've said it once and we'll say it again. I think once Tessa's contract is up, she probably will look to go elsewhere. Um, we've seen little, you know, we see saw Delilah Doom here. We saw Heather Monroe and a couple of other talents at the Vegas tapings last time, but nobody seems to stick around. Yeah, but it's just as hard because they only have impact to do it. Um, as far as his point about Tessa turning face, I mean, I, I'm from I'm familiar. With, um, I'm sure in the end she might have worked some face face matches, but I really feel like with Tessa, she's like the number one heel, top heel, and see, she would be somebody. Just say, and you know, this is fantasy booking, but what I would pit, I'd love to see her versus Rosemary in a long, drawn out feud. Mm -hmm. I really think you could have something special with that. Oh, so yeah. I, I wouldn't want to turn her face. Um, you can't convince me her facing Gail's any type of benefit to her only because Gail's what only been retired for what a year. I mean, I think if Gail had been away from the ring for some time, then maybe, but I, I, I just don't see what she benefits from, from beating, beating Gail. Yeah, and I, I, I and, and and to you know I know you he was trying to use the AJ to Vince McMahon. Um, oh, I think that's Shane, kind of but whatever. Shane, oh Shane, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My my my. They apologies. had a match at WrestleMania last year, but I don't want to see that sweaty bastard in the ring at any more. <laughs> but I mean, once again, that's you know, and then even that match here, I'll point out with that match, and I get it. You know, you want it to be a credible match, but. AJ shouldn't be going, I mean, tit for tat with Shane McMahon, who isn't an active roster member. So it's kind of like, okay, Gail's retired. I mean, I know she's still, you know, she was an active uh, wrestler when she was wrestling, obviously. But, I mean, really, Tessa should run through her because, Gail, you know, Gail's an older vet. And Tessa's, you know, the younger, you know, ta talented uh, active wrestler. So, right. but, well, um, but I get it, though. Yeah, I mean, I think the parallels between both of these feuds is that they had AJ face Shane McMahon at WrestleMania because they literally had nothing else for AJ to do, and he's a big name, and that's kind of the same thing here, where they just don't have Tessa anything for her to do, so they just throw her in a match with Gail. No, they did. They just this. I felt like this is the route they chose because remember Gail, and I guess th th that's probably the 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 one thing you can argue is because Gail costed costed uh, Tessa the title. Yeah. Um. But, I mean, this was something that they wanted to do, and like you said, probably because they didn't have no one else for her to to feud with. I really thought, and even even uh, um, you know, about a year ago, I really thought I would. I, I really thought a feud between her and Kiera, they could have done something just because you know they're both the same age, and you really can build something off of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Def definitely true. Um, so this was an interesting note and I don't want to spoil things for anybody, but, uh, uh, Rob Van Dam was apparently doing an interview recently and it looks like he may be staying on for more impact events a little later on in the future. Hmm. That, that's an interesting addition. I mean, I think he still can go, um, I'm just curious how he'd be used. Um, I'm guessing they'd probably throw him in the main event just for since he has that name power. But uh, um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, now you said he works about ten to twelve dates a year, so I mean, that would fit right in. Maybe he got what's left of the Jericho money. Yeah, that's true. He he did make a point to say, you know, talked about he talked about a double. AEW a little bit and then he said you know Impact also has RVD money and then he was asked about if he's going to work any further dates and he basically said yes you know so. the thing where, where Impact has to be careful with is you don't want to get in the habit of 
having talents like you need to make sure these are talents that want to be in impact i don't know how the contracts are constructed but you don't want a a scenario where okay well everyone's kind of waiting to see what aew becomes they want to see them take off so in the meanwhile you know they'll go sign with impact make some money get to appear on tv and and i'm not saying rvd's like that i'm sure he has a great friendship with don stemming back from the ecw days but you really got to be careful with 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 things like that like people just kind of using it to buy their time until aew or wwe or whatever uh, company comes calling Mm mm-hmm yeah, no, that is uh, true. Um, we also did learn that Moose did uh, resign this week. I believe his cr- contract was originally up in um, spring of 2020, so I don't know if this was like a restructuring deal or what they did here. But, uh, yeah, no, definitely a, a good name to lock up. He, I'm sure most companies do have interest in him. Oh, I agree. I agree. This one, out of all the resignees, this was the biggest surprise to me. You know, not that I, I, uh, um, you know, thought he was gonna leave or anything like that. But I guess I'm looking at all these resignees, and I'm guessing these are people that they're gonna, you know, they're gonna have plans for. Obviously, if you're gonna sign to multi-year deals, and obviously the people are gonna agree to sign these multi-year deals. You know, there's, you know, I, I wouldn't say so much of a promise, but there's some belief that they're gonna be utilized in a better capacity if they're not already. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you have anything you want to add? Yeah, just real quick, and I know I share this with you. I was wondering, and you you tell me what you think. I know my my battery's about to run out, so I'll try to make this quick. But I was thinking, what if now that they got explosion on, and for listeners too, I want the listeners to take on it as well. I wonder what if they made explosion the home of the X division. And what I mean by this is like, obviously you still have, you could still have the champion still appear on impact. I don't want to make it seem like, you know, they're, you know, inferior to people who appear on the impact broadcast, but pretty much the X division is kind of like the headliner of the show. So you'd have the champion really be the guy of the show. You still have other matches, whether it's, you know, some knockouts matches or tag matches, but you could always have the X division championship defended there. It, pretty much serve like the world title on explosion mm. and then what you do is you know you, you really use explosion as a way to really kind of um build up who you're going to want to be some of your top guys and then eventually have them move on to the impact broadcast it's an interesting concept you know i think the one thing that stands in that way is we really don't have a definition of what an x division competitor is Oh yeah, <laughs> that, is, that is true, and 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 I think I think too something like that can open the door for a, a mid card title if they wanted to. I don't because we we've talked about it enough, but the X Division isn't the X Division title isn't a mid card title. They've I think the when I'm saying the damage that they've done, if you look at the majority of the title holders, they all kind of fit that under two twenty uh, mold, and we all know you know usually guys who are under 220 or 250 i forget what the weight class is Mm. you know they're essentially light heavyweights to cruiserweight guys so when you have a majority of those guys and then on top of that those guys a lot of them they stayed at the x division it's very seldom that some of these guys have moved up the ladder and right you know whether whether they've gotten you know the world title or when they had the mid card title the mid card title so you're right. They'd obviously have to define that a little bit, but just pretty much it gives them an opportunity to not only sh- high, uh, showcase the X Division, but you can also uh, utilize some of the lower tier people that you might want to have plans for, but you want to test them out on Explosion. Yeah. But it was just a, a little concept I was thinking, but what, what do you think of it as a whole? No, yeah, it's not not a bad idea because it seems like those are generally the talents they're most interested in bringing in, as we've seen, you know, with Ace Austin and uh, uh, what's his name, Atlas, who he faced. Um, you know, we saw Trey Miguel, the rest of the Rascals. It seems like those people that they've been bringing in have fit that moniker of the X Division, at least in our minds. So, you know, it, it, it's definitely something to think about. Uh, you know, I think uh, some sort of Twitch title would be a cool thing that they could use with explosion and utilize those on the Twitch shows because I mean, anytime there's a title match on those Twitch shows, you're generally not going to have a title change. I don't think we've ever seen one. And I think with a Twitch title, it would be more likely. Yeah, exactly. I think that would be something fun, almost like a current day, you know, hardcore title, so to speak, where it's defended 24 seven, you know, on all the shows. 
Yeah. Just like I said, it was just a, a funny little thought out yeah. at the gym thinking about it. I said, you know, that'd be pretty, pretty neat. And so because that that's just the problem that we have. And, you know, we see with some of the commenters, they've even, you know, shared how, you know, we, we need new blood or anything like that. It's just it's so hard to bring in somebody new because in order to get them over, it's going to come at the expense of someone else who you might have plans for. Like, you know, they only have enhancement talent work here and there. It's not something that they, you know obviously have so essentially you're turning in people on uh on your roster into enhancement talent yeah. and that hurts in the end yeah because i think the only person they had brought back from mexico was daga and he i think worked an explosion match and that's about it and there you go yep and that is it i think that is all for this week ro thanks for joining me once again let us know what you guys thought of our show. And until next time, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks, guys. Bye.